welcome everyone. Uh, it's lovely to have you here and to talk about this uh, really, really, um, it's, I, don't, I don't know what to call it. I was going to say sweet book because it's it's small and delicious, um, but it's actually really, I found it really nutritious. So it's more than dessert. It feels like, uh, um, well, it got such concentrated flavors. When I wrote to Mark after um, he sent me a copy to read, I said it crystallized things for me. I kept going through the book. As I was reading through the book, I thought, yes, that summarizes a whole bunch of things that I was thinking yeah. down into a few sentences. You know, and some of the sub clauses, you know, it's throwaway sub clauses were so dense that I had to actually take time out and ignore the sentence around it and just focus on the sub clause to kind of draw out everything that Mark had kind of condensed down into what he was writing. Um, you know, of course, this is part of a series that Routledge has put together, and the editor of the series, Anna Goblin, is with us to, with us today. He's going to talk a bit about the series. And um, you know, the, the goal of the series, as I'm sure Anna will talk more about, is to um, get people to write short. It's, these, these books are 40,000 words, and there's 23 books out at the moment, or I think slightly less than 23 out, but another three, uh, there's more coming out. So the total of 23 actually on the Routledge page. And I've, I hope you can see in your chat that I've put the link to the Routledge series as well as the link to Mark's book. If if it's not coming up in the chat, I'll put it again later towards the end of the meeting. Um, but I, I'm really looking forward to reading other books in the series because this book, to, I don't know how it would come across to someone who is new to Jung, but to to uh, to someone who is kind of steeped in Jung, this book just was, a, a, it, was like, it was like all the bells were going off. I just kept thinking, yes, yes, yes. And it was actually really lovely to read in that way. And it gave me it, it, it gave me a new perspective on some of the ideas um, that, that I had. It just kind of crystallized and twisted him. So we're really, um, really uh, privileged to have both Mark and Anna here today. And um, before I witter on too much, um, I'm going to um, ask um, both Mark and Anna to um, a few questions to get them talking about the book. Okay. Um, okay. And um, so, um, Mark, this book, you know, it's situated within uh, a series that seems to be about bringing a range of psychoanalytic ideas together and in some ways showing a kind of a common thread. So uh, from our conversations, I know that comparative psychoanalysis um, is something that's sort of interest to you. And how did you get the bug for that? Um, yeah, that's a, the, the opportunity to write this book was really just fit a perfect place for me. Um, I actually was, I took some undergraduate courses in Freud uh, very early in my life and just did not, did not connect with Freud at all. And during my clinical internship, heard about Jung and was really drawn into the way this person was talking about Jung. And I got deeply immersed in Jung. But uh, then I was stationed at the U.S. Military Academy as a clinical psychologist for uh, three years. And the director of my clinic was a graduate of the William Allison White Institute in New York. And so he was always encouraging me to apply to the William Allison White Institute and talking about different psychoanalytic theories. And his office was lined with psychoanalytic books. And so I feel like I've been having a foot in both worlds since 1987, 1988. Uh, and then I had a really marvelous uh, supervisor, actually several supervisors, but one in particular, Mel Marshak, who had trained in London at the Society for Analytical Psychology uh, quite a long and lived in London uh, for 40 years and was intimate with all of these key figures in the, the developmental perspective, especially Michael Fordham, and, but had contacts with Winnicott and Gerhard Adler and other prominent figures. And so she was really steeped in this tradition of merging the ideas of psychoanalysis, particularly object relations and Melanie Klein with Jungian ideas. And so this has just been a, a theme throughout my career from very early on, 
going over 30 years now. And so when Anir approached me by email with the opportunity to write this book, it just fit perfectly for what my interests were. I suppose that's a... Uh, um... You mentioned the SAP, of course. That's uh, the, I mean, I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm from London, and so mm -hmm. I, and that I kind of get that uh, milieu immediately. That that sort of uh, the heady cocktail of of Klein and Jung, which is a particular. Do you, is that a, coming from inside London? We kind of I suppose we kind of think that's a particular London thing. So mm -hmm. I was quite surprised when I met someone from the Midwest who had exactly the same kind of uh sort of comfort with the way those ideas might fit together i mean do you mm -hmm. think that's a perspective that is particularly london or is it is it more shared i mean i i think it certainly started in london uh you know and the, the one of the first splits that occurred uh within uh the analytical psychology field and we know that psychoanalytic institutes and societies like to split um, but Gerhard Adler and a very classical Zurich oriented model mm. split out of the SAP to form uh, another institute in London. And so there were two institutes in mm. London. Mm. Um, and so originally it was referred to as the London school in yeah. uh, distinction to the Zurich school. Yes. But now I think it's been it's spread far enough. It's spread throughout the world um, that we really speak out of it now as the developmental school rather than mm. the London school. And so it's less geographically oriented and more conceptually and technique oriented. Mm. I suppose one of the movements that has in psychoanalysis that has moved from psychoanalysis towards Jung, uh, because when we talk about the London and the developmental school, we talk about it's, you could think about Jungian sort of reaching out in towards psychoanalysis for understanding around infancy and developmental uh, developmental dynamics. But mm -hmm. one of the one of the schools that reaches out the other way, at least to my mind, is the relational school. You know? um, and I think that the relational school, relational psychoanalysis, has a strong basis in the states. I mean, is is that is that your impression? Yeah, I think that's. I think the relational school is very much um, uh, a thing that came out of the United States, particularly uh, out of the William Allison White Institute, and so it's. I think much stronger in the U.S. than it is in other parts of the world. But they they do have their own international presence now. Yes. Uh, Green Greenberg and Mitchell, uh, Jay Greenberg and Stephen Mitchell wrote a book in the late 80s called Object Relations in Psychoanalytic Theory. And that's another that's another book that uh, was influential on me is their ability to go into these object relations theories, but identify the relational elements of it. Mm, 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 mm. Uh, but like my book wouldn't have happened without. Andrew Samuel's book, Jung in the Post-Jungians, that was written in 1985. Mm -hmm. And Fred Pine wrote a book, Drive, Ego, Object, and Self. And uh, a guy named Elman wrote a book, Where Theories Touch. Thomas Ogden wrote mm -hmm. The Matrix of the Mind. So there's all yes. of these really wonderful yes. cross-pollinations yes. that yes. have been influential in my own perspective of yes. seeing the value and being able to approach the patient rather than trying to fit the patient into the theory, trying yes. to find the theory that fits the patient. That's right, yes. I, I mean, okay, look, being a card-carrying Jungian, I would be able to say to you that, that, that Jung was saying exactly that, you know, a uh, hundred years ago. You know, mm -hmm. and if, if, you know, when I say card, I mean, I know that that is such a stereotype. You hear mm -hmm. people kind of say that and be very self-satisfied in Jungian meetings everywhere, but there's a lot of truth in it. But I suppose what I'm thinking is that a lot of relational psychoanalysts you know, writing since the 80s have kind of been, have been saying things that are very familiar to Jungians. Do you think there's that kind of recognition on the side, on the relational analyst side? Oh, I don't think there's that much recognition. Um, and I think that goes both ways. You know, there was, there was a long history of uh, attempting to... Uh, blackball Jung, you know, from in the early days. And, um, you know, there was the, the, the 
ring circle from Freud and yeah. uh, that was originated where Freud gave out all these signet rings to his closest cohorts and uh, not just to deal with Jung, but to deal with others that fell out of disfavor, mm. like Wilhelm Reich and Otto Gross and people like this. And so there was an active uh, suspicion, denigration of Jung within psychoanalytic circles for a long time. But I think that's that's diminished significantly. And I think that it goes both ways. I think that Jungians in general have held the ideas of Jung in such a way that it makes it has made it difficult to have these cross uh, theoretical dialogues. And so we, we've contributed as much to our own insularity as the attitude from within the psychoanalytic world. You know, we just, yes. I mean, there's many, many more unions now that read a variety of psychoanalytic literature. And so that's shifted. Uh, but th there's still a pretty significant voice within analytical psychology that says we're completely different. There's mm. not an overlap. We're not psychoanalysis. We're something different. And I think that's an unfortunate attitude. Mm. My own feeling is that if the system of thought is organized around the unconscious, we may have different ways of languaging the unconscious, mm -hmm. but a focus on the unconscious is the central thing that underlies all forms of psychoanalysis. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I mean, I suppose there's an interesting thought that's emerging is that um, when you were talking about the giving out of the signet rings, I was immediately thinking about the roles of um, organizations like the IAP, um, which has an accrediting, uh, a certifying role, a certifying trainings, and that, you know, that to be, uh, uh, to call yourself a Jungian analyst or an analytical psychologist, you have to be an IAP member. Um, you know, is there... A, I mean, I can. I think that it's. It's. I can see. For me, I still see the importance of that. Um, but do you think there? Uh, I suppose there's thoughts forming on my mind now. Is that are? You, do you think there's a, a a vision of a sort of a vision of the profession in the future where some of those boundaries are, are disappearing, where there isn't a need for a separate category, or is there a way in which the separate categories still exist, but they have more uh they have more formal or more direct links well i'm sure anir can speak to this as well uh, but from my perspective is we do need these organizations because there there is there are so many people out there who would uh present themselves as a psycho psychoanalyst yes. uh, and essentially could conduct what i think of as what Freud called wild analysis yes. uh, and that without some protective interests uh, around the title of psychoanalysis and psychoanalyst, I think that things uh, would become chaotic and yes. that consumers of processes of this process wouldn't be able to necessarily understand or trust mm. uh, in the, in the training of someone. So I think there's a value in it. Um, yes. I would say that I hope that we begin to put psychoanalyst first and theoretical orientation second um, mm -hmm. in our identities, in the way we think yes. of ourselves. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. And that the primary training we have, whatever institute it's in, is seen as our kind of foundational training that we mm -hmm. add things to, is the yes. way yes. I, I look at it. Yes. That, uh, uh, but that, uh, maybe that Anir think, could. Yes, definitely. I think that I immediately want to start thinking about uh, about your connection with Beyond. But actually, Anna, the to pull together a series like this, and I hope the link to the series is coming up in the chat. I'll put it in again in a moment. I mean, the range of authors in the series and the range of topics in the series. I mean, there really are. Um, I was quite struck. There's a some some seems to me some kind of clever or some very clear thought behind how this series has been put together um do you, uh, do you want to say a bit how the series came to be and how it is that you managed to 
find and select these brilliant authors on these topics? Yes, well, I I, uh, I see myself, first of all, as someone who um, who is specialized in comparative psychoanalysis. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I admire the richness of psychoanalysis. Anal- anal- and with all its schools, with all its organizations, even, even though they're, they're mostly um, is, is many times split up and have wars and struggles between <laughs> them, but to take the little the, the zoom a little further, you can see a very rich world, very mm. fertile world mm. that is producing more and more ideas and uh, in, in in a wonderful way. And I just love this the whole conglomerate of of these uh, theories. And so the series is um, ha- wants to uh, um, reflect this richness. And so it's it's really sort of uh, a huge encyclopedia. But instead of many hundreds of entries, there there will be dozens and dozens of books about. Mm. about my vision is to make it on, on many many subjects in psychoanalysis, and there are twenty three books. Uh, twenty appeared already. Three books will appear uh, in the near future, but there are dozens that are going to to appear. And so, uh, one of the uh, one of the mode of inspiration, my mode of inspiration was. Ox- Oxford very short introduction series. I don't know if you're familiar mm. with it. Yeah. Wonderful series, a very successful one. They have hundreds of books on every topic in the world. And I thought if there is such a thing in general, why can't we do it on psychoanalysis, mm-hmm. specific mm. on psychoanalysis? Mm-hmm. So that's that's real, really my, my vision. And I offered it to Rutledge and they were keen to, uh, to accept it. And it's go- going on for two or, or three years now. And we have a little stuff actually, for, because it's a big, it's a, really a giant project. So I have uh, uh, two assistants that helping me in informing that. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, and it turns out that people just love reading short introductory books because they give they give it, it their fantasy is that they will read short books and will have <laughs> gain control on the subject. And that's <laughs> that's mm-hmm. what. But but I really want want them to read a short introductory book to make them more interest and then pursue mm-hmm. it in a, in more depth and read other mm-hmm. other books. So. I I um I got to Mark after reading his wonderful book on interpretation. I read mm. uh, Jungian interpretation, which I recommend uh, with all my heart. So and and I said this is I want Mark to to uh, also to uh, to read to to uh, to write the introductory book about Jungian psycho analysis. And so what I think is that it, that there is also um, something that I wanted to say that the the, the, the series called. Rutledge introductions books to psychoanalysis, and so Jung has a a place in the series, of course. And this is something that I think you talked about earlier, that um, uh, for very for many reasons, uh, Jungian psychoanalysis was not part of mainstream psychoanalysis. Unfortunately, I think. And it has to do. It's amazing how the rift between mm-hmm. Freud and Jung is was so had so uh, um powerful impact even mm. uh, even until today mm, mm, and mm. i think jung never never recovered from that departure uh for his entire life and he was mm. he was by the way very ambivalent to uh, uh organize his own independent uh, organization mm-hmm. so i think i wanted to say look this is psychoanalysis and Jungian psychoanalysis is part of that. And Marx's books, is, I think it also is a bridge between mainstream psychoanalysis and Jungian psychoanalysis. So, so people can uh, see that it's not so, it's not, it's not uh, something that are two separate worlds, but they have connection and they can take mm-hmm. from each other and can, can uh, fertile each other in many ways. Mm-hmm. And I said, some of the titles in the series, I, I mean, the, the, some of the books are about individuals. So uh, Melanie Klein or um, I think you've got Herbert Rosenfeld and James F. Martinson and Marion, Marion Milner. So you've got these personalities who um, uh, and, and then you've also got sort of key concepts. Um, so there's guilt, uh, projective identification. Um, how 
what is your instinct in um sort of bringing out these books how are you how how are you finding your way to these particular personalities that you're featuring um and um what is what is bringing these particular topics to mind well, as I said, I imagine a huge encyclopedia, and I imagine that every entry in this encyclopedia, every every concept that deserves an entry in this encyclopedia also deserves a book. And all these core concepts, I think, deserve to be mm. included in the psychoanalytic encyclopedia. Mm. It must be a central, uh, a central concept. We don't have subtitles. I mean, the, the, the titles must be very simple, mm. the core mm. concept or the figure itself, and that's it. We don't have subtitles. We don't have specific niche theories, but just core concepts that are familiar mm. by all. Uh, we will soon have, for example, uh, uh, The Negative, uh, an introductory book about The Negative, which is uh -huh. a very interesting core concept. Yes. And uh, and many others, you know, uh, we, are, uh, we will have about dreams, about schizophrenia, uh, so it, it's it's sort of random. Uh, I mean, the, the the selection is sort of random. If I find a core concept or an author that proposes, because now authors are in, uh, <laughs> submitting their their own coming for me independently and submitting their own uh, preference for writing a book, and and so if there is a core concept or a, or a figure that is in, that was influential, uh, I will give it a chance. Uh -huh. Yes, I mean, some of the names featured, um, like Donald Meltzer, uh, uh, Wilfred Bion, um, these are the kind of people, uh, or Herbert Rosenfeld or Michael Eigen. Uh, these are kind of the, for me, this is the strong stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, really excited to kind of see them in the series. Um, well, I mean, look, we look forward to the future of the series, and I think everyone will, um, you know, uh, you've got the link. You, if you want to buy some of these books, mm -hmm. you, you can... Um, this is a series that certainly is going to, I think, become standard on people's bookshelves. Um, so uh, yes, let yeah. me just add that I also uh, I also have with my partner Sharon Ziv Bayman uh, a Zoom series where we entertain each month host uh, a prominent figure in our field and uh, and have have the audience actually talk talk uh -huh. to that figure. Uh, we had Antonina Ferro, we had John Steiner. We have here Karen mm. Gennaro, who is uh, uh, who is our guest regularly, uh, and um, and uh, or or we have books that comes out, and we do like like you do, launch books, new books, and so that's also uh, a way of bringing all sorts of voices in psychoanalysis mm. to people who are interested in. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And I would say that uh, Anir's uh, commission to me was very inviting uh, in terms of mm -hmm. not just his, the warmth of the invitation, but really the very uh, broad but specific recommendations or requests to address in the book. And he said, we don't want an introduction for the lay audience. We want an introduction for somebody who has an exposure to psychoanalytic theory that will help them place Jung within their understanding of psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. And he said, we don't want just an endorsement of Jung's ideas. We want a critical assessment of his ideas. Mm -hmm. And we want to know how you utilize these things in your practice. Mm -hmm. And so the, those, the, those three or four key focus really uh, helped focus the, the, the book itself and uh, for me, gave me a lot of latitude uh, to uh, engage in the kind of dialogue around these ideas that I was interested in having. Yes, this this is a very important what Mark said because these are not just reviews of a subject. We ask authors not just to review a subject, but also to uh, write about their original contribution to the subject. We want to hear their own unique voice. Mm. And so it's part, it's it's really a challenge because they write to an audience who is not well familiar with the subject, 
but these are this, this is not just the audience we are interested in. We are interested also in people that knows about the subject subject and wants to know even more. So that's a challenge to you know to navigate between these two audiences. Mm, 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 mm. Um, so I'm aware that three of us have been talking and that maybe there's some thoughts pricking at the back of the minds of the people, other people on this conversation. So at, if at this point anyone has any thoughts or questions or, um, that they'd like to raise, please either just unmute yourself and raise your voice or use the reaction button to raise your hand or say so in the chat. And um, happy to hear from other people uh, in the conversation. Um, but um, Mark, while, while people think about my, what they might want to ask or say, uh, mm -hmm. a question has been on my mind, and um, and I'm aware that was it last weekend you spoke at a, a conference hosted by Essex University on Beyond, and Beyond features a lot in your thoughts, um, and I'm wondering, um, I suppose I'm. Uh, I would like to ask many questions and I have, so mm -hmm. I'll ask a two-parter and you can emphasize, firstly, the first part is how did you personally come into contact with that strange ex colonel mm -hmm. <laughs> um, who started and started in a knitting circle with Melanie Klein and ended up in California. I mean, how did you yes. first encounter this man? And um, secondly, um, what is the un what are the kind of unique ways in which you think that Beyond and Jung kind of intersect? Yeah, that's uh, that's been a long road as well. And uh, again, Mel Marshak was the woman who introduced me to Beyond, and I don't think I really understood or appreciated the significance of of him initially, and was uh, you know just fumbling around in the his literature. Uh, and, but over time, the, the ideas have formed and I wrote a paper that I presented in Buenos Aires in 2022 at the IAP Congress, uh, called working with patients with disruptions in symbolic capacity. Mm. And that's really where I think Bion speaks at a level that Jung only briefly alludes to mm. that when we come into the Jungian training, most of the uni Jungian training is very much oriented around uh, or a big emphasis is on around archetypal theory and archetypal imagery uh, that Jung proposes comes from this repository that he refers to as the collective unconscious. And so there's a big emphasis on mythology and fairy tales, religious motifs, and even alchemy as metaphors for psychic processes. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is, is that we don't do a great job in the training of differentiating patients who can work at a symbolic level mm -hmm. uh, and patients who do not have that capacity to work mm -hmm. symbolically. And unfortunately, we live in a time uh, a psychoanalyst named James Masterson uh, referred to this, started referring to this in the call, uh, some in his books, Disorders of the Self, in which we, we largely char characterize them as personality disorders mm -hmm. uh, or personality configurations that have a degree of rigidity to them. And often these individuals are not functioning symbolically. They can't, if they dream about a car, and you ask them for their thoughts about a car, they said, oh, well, I drive a Ford or I drive a Toyota or my father liked Chevrolets or uh, whatever their association is. Mm -hmm. But they can't see the car as something that represents something else. Mm -hmm. And so Beyond has this whole idea of what he calls beta elements and mm -hmm. that other people have come to refer to as non-represented states things that are not repressed out of the unconscious, they've never been represented in the conscious. So they're kind of free-floating, sensory, affective, somatic experiences mm -hmm. that need to coalesce into a representation of some form in the psyche so they can be dealt, become dealt with as symbolic events, psychological mm -hmm. experience. 
And that's really where Beyond's whole system is oriented around that. And it's like they dovetail almost like layers where mm. Jung's dealing very much up here with the symbolic level. And then Beyond comes in and provides this foundation mm -hmm. that allows us to work analytically with non-symbolic material. Mm, mm. And that's just not articulated in Jung in any sort of differentiated way. Mm. And so I'm trying to bring this into the institutes that I teach in and give people exposure to this. And that's really where it's coalesced is to see this, um, see this relation, this complementary relationship between the two theories and a near, um, mentioned uh, Antonino Ferro and his close colleague Giuseppe Sevetorese and they, they've developed they're referred to as post beonians and some of their ideas when you're reading them are actually seem to fit so well with Jungian ideas that we can even dovetail Jung's idea of the transcendent function with Beyond's idea of what he calls alpha function, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. the capacity to process this these beta elements into something mm. he calls alpha elements or represented experience. Mm. And mm. now Silva Teresa and Ferro have proposed uh, this idea of what they call the sometimes they refer to it as the mega alpha function, or sometimes they refer to it as the super alpha function. But their description of that process is almost identical with Jung's description of the transcendent function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let, let me so, just add to that uh, a, a small comment that uh, we have another book on the series called Spiritual Sensitive Psychoanalysis. And it shows that spirituality is actually part of psychoanalysis with Jung or without Jung, uh, like with authors like Michael Eigen and beyond and Winnicott and Grotstein and 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 other uh, and many authors mm -hmm. so the, there is no the 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 the, the exclusion out of jungian psychoanalysis from mainstream psychoanalysis has no is no reason logical reason it's only about the identity of groups and what happened be between mm -hmm. freud and Hume. i'll give you a short example if if i'll give you a list of carl rogers Melanie Klein, uh, Donald Winnicott, and Beyond. And I ask you, who is who does not fit in that list? Most of you will say Carl Rogers. But there is a great affinity between Carl Rogers. Oh, I'm sorry. And, and the, the most important name is Coat. Yes. Uh, Coat, mm -hmm. Klein, Beyond, and Carl Rogers. And most of you will say Carl Rogers because he is a He's a humanistic psychology, a centered person psychology. But actually, uh, Carl Rogers is more close to uh, Kohut than Melanie Klein is. But still, our, our mind separates groups across their mm. identity. And so mm. Rogers is not part of mainstream psychoanalysis, but Melanie Klein and Kohut are. So that's what makes us group it together. The same thing happen, happens about Jung. Because of this split early in the history of psychoanalysis, uh, mainstream psychoanalysis tend to see Jungian analysts as, you know, a little bit eccentric, mm -hmm. um, say, uh, a strange mystical ideas, which is not part of the medical ethos and rationality. Uh, but the truth is that all these spiritual ideas, non-medical, uh, are, are really ingrained within mainstream psychoanalysis for many years. So there is no logical reason for this separation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, uh, I think it was 1999, Robert Wallerstein, who's a former uh, president of the International Psychoanalytic Association, was being interviewed by uh, Virginia Hunter. And he said, uh, if Jung had proposed his ideas today, mm -hmm. there would have been no separation. There would have been no need for separation because many of the ideas that he proposed have already found their way into psychoanalysis through other doors. Right. 
That is he, true. He's another one that's really advocated for uh, this uh, comparative or pluralistic view of psychoanalysis. He wrote a book uh, called The Common Ground of Psychoanalysis. And he said, we're never going to agree on the, the theoretical details uh, of what causes what. Uh, but he said, we can agree on the clinical details of what we observe in the analytic session. And that in some sense, um, or it was uh, Jonathan Lear uh, in a marvelous paper called Final Causes, uh, he takes four different uh, theoretical perspectives and analyzes the same case from each perspective. And he says, realistically, uh, we're all working towards freedom. Mm. He said, that's the final goal is psychological, emotional freedom. And all of these theories are trying to create that in the individual we're working with. That's great. And I, I want to add to that, that there is no need uh, of an agreement that people will agree about the same thing. There, it's, it's a great thing that there is diversity mm -hmm. and richness and fascinated analysts that each adhere to his own group and to his own organization. I think it's, it's a wonderful situation, mm -hmm. but I think we need people like Mark that bridges between the theories and and try to uh, try to um, uh, exchange ideas between between the different schools. So we need these yeah. fascinated analysts who are just have loyalty to their own one theory. That's great. Let them pursue their work. Let them let them let them continue and exploring uh, the richness of their own theory. But we also need people who. Who do a dialogue, integrative and comparative work between the uh, the different schools? And I think, uh, as much as I advocate for this pluralistic perspective, there's also things that I think the union world does marvelously well. Mm -hmm. That is our, a genuine strength, and that they do have something to bring to these other schools of psychoanalysis, and particularly what we refer to as. Um, archetypal theory, if we think about that more broadly as all of these things, myths, fairy tales, religious motifs, alchemical processes, as well as film and literature, um, pop culture, all of these things potentially serve as metaphors. Mm -hmm. And we now know from neuroscience that the human psyche is optimized to respond affectively and somatically to metaphor mm, mm. and the union training provides a deep exposure to metaphor mm. and we become used to translating metaphor into psychological experience the only thing is is we don't refer to it as metaphor unfortunately we refer to it as archetype i think if we mm. cast a broader umbrella and thought, well, all archetypal material is also metaphor, mm. it would be a much more fluid, flexible system, and also allow for more cross theoretical dialogue between analytical psychology and psychoanalysis. For example, Ar Arnold Modell, who's a psychoanalyst who has no union training whatsoever, but he writes beautifully about metaphor. Um, I just want to thank you, Mark, for bringing this um, very comprehensive, I would say, work. Um, I just want to ponder uh, something that you said about freedom and diversity and the separation between the two schools. Uh, at some, from my perspective, I don't see uh, from the broad perspective they are the same mm -hmm. i don't think we should try to be uh also to make this point of uh, we want to be psychoanalysts mm -hmm. because you know sounds like freud legend goes on and i see very much a difference between jung and freud in many respects 
mm. but also many similarities. We're still having this table of dialogue, mm. uh, European-centered, Eurocentered, Western mm -hmm. approach to psychology. Mm -hmm. So there's, in this sense, there's not much of a difference. Mm -hmm. um, why I like uh, Jung better, because mm -hmm. although uh, Jung presents a colonial view of the world and the mm -hmm. westernized mind, mm -hmm. uh, he gives a hint, and he himself criticized colonization in one of, mm -hmm. I think it's in the volume 18. Mm -hmm. He has a quote that he despised colonization, but he gives a hint on how to bring other peoples, indigenous mm -hmm. peoples, to this dialogue. Mm -hmm. And this hint is it comes from uh, mythological studies, mm -hmm. but also by his interest in more diverse population. So this hint makes Jung um, himself bring new perspectives to his own theory. Mm -hmm. And I imagine Jung today um, also focusing on other forms of healing and well-being that it's less on non-Western. And mm -hmm. my preoccupation is um, how much post-Jungians are actually new in their way to approach the psyche. Mm -hmm. Or they are just bringing the same concept and expanding it, bringing their perspective according to contemporary uh, thoughts that for me are the same. So how mm -hmm. can you expand that and bring a decolonial option to Jungian studies? That's part of my interest and um, research. But I would like to hear your thoughts on it. Um, I think there's two things that I would say is I would say certainly we can think of Jung as one of the uh, founders of a multicultural perspective and uh, that he really laid the groundwork, you know, however, he, however limited he was in his being able to get outside his own uh, colonial influences. I mean, you know, there's a lot of research and debate, scholarly debate coming out now around all of that, but certainly he had a much greater sensitivity to those themes than uh, I think most other psychoanalysts of his day. I think there, there's an important to, um, to distinguish between broad broadly psych influencing psychological experience and there's new things that are coming out like this arts-based research uh, mm -hmm. movement with um, Susan Rowland and um, some others particularly there's a new group in London that's mm -hmm. facilitating a lot of um, a lot of experiential workshops around this. And I think that's one way of reaching people with Jungian ideas mm. outside of the uh, psychoanalytic consulting room. Uh, there's another uh, guy uh, in Washington, D.C., who's not an analyst, but he's a psychologist, uh, an African-American psychologist, deeply immersed in Jung's writing. And he's using ideas from Jung to create programs that uh, around myth that are designed to intervene with at-risk black youths. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we're, we're seeing people make inroads to finding ways to bring these ideas out into a broader perspective. But I would also say that I don't think we've gotten anywhere near plumbing the full extent of the value of personal individual psychoanalysis mm -hmm. and that it's mm -hmm. something that needs to be renewed over and over again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with each generation and i think it's become because of the influences of now widely available online therapies and the the effect of the pandemic we've got a, a new generation of people being trained analytically in all sorts of different theoretical orientations that actually have very little time in a room with their personal analyst, with their supervisors and with their patients. Hmm. And I don't think it's 
that good work can't be done by video. I often do work by video and good work gets done. But I think the need to ground ourselves in the fundamental practice of analysis and the technique of analysis mm -hmm. is the bedrock of our um, our field and yes. that it's it's ever more important more important than ever uh, to maintain a thorough grounding in that uh, foundation mm -hmm. yeah I think if we lose that grounding uh, we lose kind of a core fundamental, center that we all share yes absolutely i mean it, it i think that is one of the strengths of um w one of the strengths of the jungian approach from the beginning um is the focus on relationship you know the idea that if someone's get, if someone in the room is going to change then both have to change um mm -hmm. the idea that the person of the analyst is important and i think it was jung who stress the importance of the training the training analysis that the ana the analyst had to be analyzed um you know of course the other early person in, in who felt that same way was sandor forenzi who i see is one of the people in the series covered in the series uh so really warmed my heart i mean of course and he was melanie klein's first analyst and mm -hmm. um and so i suppose the point i'm making is that the the that um that at the, on the one hand, our collective profession, the object of our focus is the unconscious, but the other key element that I think is returning, uh, well, has never gone far away, is the idea of the relationship. Uh, I, I mean, mm -hmm. Freud did say psychoanalysis is a cure by love. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that that is something that, in, especially in our world, I mean, it's not a, it's a the focus on the relationship is all is perennial, is always important and always very difficult. Um, but it's especially important now in a world that is becoming hyper connected, but also hyper atomized. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're talking about the difference between in person work or online work, I think that that is the site of what we're talking about is what is the texture of the relationship can the texture of the relationship exist across this medium and i suppose that's the central question that we're wrestling with at the moment um anyway that's a more of a comment than a question but you know i was wondering one of the uh, one of the chapters in the book was about training um and i know that you have an interest in core competencies um i mean is there is there a way in which, and I know this is something that's being considered within the IAP at the moment, what are our core competencies, mm -hmm. competencies alongside a related question, which is what are our core values? I mean, mm -hmm. what thoughts do you have around that in terms of this focus on your interest in con on comparative psychoanalysis? Um, yeah, I think it, this idea of core competencies is making inroads in a variety of things. I was involved with the American Board for Accreditation in Psychoanalysis for nine years and chaired the uh, accreditation committee for about seven years. And during that time, we implement, there's, I think, 18 member institute, accredited institutes through the American Board. And so all of those institutes have to meet the standards established by that board. And that includes three Jungian institutes and a variety of psychoanalytic institutes that probably represent five or six other theoretical orientations from modern psychoanalysis to relational psychoanalysis, um, object relations, theories, et cetera. And so we had to find, we, we wanted to move towards accrediting through core competencies and we had a, a committee of about eight analysts from various theoretical persuasions. And we had to find a way to find mm. what we thought of as universal core mm. competencies that applied regardless of the theoretical orientation that yes. you had. And so we, mm. we spent hundreds of hours literally debating about mm. how to language these core competencies that are mm. all published on the American Board for Accreditation Psycho of Psychoanalysis website. Um, 
And so the, the whole idea about core competencies is we tend to teach, instructors tend to teach in psychoanalytic training, whether it's uh, from some uh, psychoanalytic perspective or from analytical psychology, they teach a course telling the candidate what they need to know. Core competencies shifts the focus of training and learning from what should they know to are they able to apply what mm -hmm. they know mm -hmm. and how do we define that application uh, in terms of a competency. Mm -hmm. So I can teach a course on interpretation, but the emphasis is not that they know about interpretation is can they do it after they've completed the course? Mm -hmm. Is it a skill that they can develop over time? And is there a way of evaluating that skill in a consistent way? Mm -hmm. And so it's a real shift. I think it's gonna be a very difficult, it's a difficult shift for everyone. We spent about a year and a half educating all of our accredited institutes about core competencies. We had about uh, four or five training sessions where we broke it down, showed them how to develop core competencies, how to language their curriculum in terms of core competencies, it was quite an involved process. Hmm. Um, and the union training tends to not want to be systematized. And so there are some broad categories that the International Association for Analytical Psychology says that training has to take place around. There's about eight of them that the I, eight or nine categories that the IAP says you need to be exposed to the, this area, this content area. For example, transference and counter-transference, knowledge of anthropology, knowledge of these various archetypal systems, et cetera. And, but they don't make any uh, statements about what need, they need, the candidate needs to be able to do with that exposure to those content areas. And so core competencies shifts the focus to what should we be able to expect a candidate to do by the time they graduate. Mm, 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 mm. That's going to be a difficult transition. Uh, yes. As you mentioned, there's within analytical psychology, there's now some work being done at the international level. And there's been a book published on Jungian core competencies mm -hmm. by uh, Grazina Godet from Lithuania and Tom Kelly are the editors and I contributed a chapter on interpretation mm -hmm. to that book. Uh, and so that's a good first stab at uh, movement in this direction. And I mm -hmm. hope some of the institutes begin to pick up on this and that we can at least come to agree on what a central core curriculum, even though there may be many electives that are available to candidates within a particular orientation within a particular geographic region that allows it to be not systematized so much that we don't account for these differences that Hannah was referring to in different regions mm -hmm. and that somebody in China, for example, may have a very different relationship to some of these core concepts and some of these techniques that we apply than somebody who grows up in the United States. Yes. Mark? Yeah, Mary. You turn you you're off again. You muted yourself again, I think. Yeah, there there you go. Touchy fingers. <laughs> so I I wanted to say first of all that uh this volume, uh this short, concise volume would have been a brilliant uh, introduction for me, uh, having been a participant in the Memphis Atlanta seminar, this was, this would have been a great primer. I know that you would want it to be for seasoned analysts. However, I found it to be invaluable and really kind of bring in um, starting place because it's such a rich field and mm -hmm. so expanded. How could you possibly read everything? Um, but this was beautifully concise, yes, so rich. 
Really appreciate it. Uh, and I also appreciate the series itself. And I look forward, very much look forward to the other. It would be like the collected works for me. Like I would like to have these little concise collected works on this series. So thank you for that. Um, you know, Mark, you said something about, um, well, I, I also want to say that the Memphis Atlanta seminar being, being involved in that, I really also appreciated that this particular seminar was more expansive, uh, in terms of we were trained in not just union works, but all of the post unions and, uh, bringing in all these views. So I appreciated being a part of that seminar as well, because of that, um, you said, Mark, that uh, people like to, the, the union community likes to split off. And, and, and what it sounds like for me is that you are, you know, you have been in and others have been in the process of birthing this new uh, way of being in the analytic community. Um, and in its birthing, are you finding that it's going to be a welcome baby or a bastard child and the family's going to be split up? What are your thoughts about that? Um, I think in general, we're moving in the, the field of analytical psychology is moving in this direction. It's certainly a lot more open. Many of the candidates that I teach uh, in Zurich, in Russia, in Romania, uh, and other places are much more open to these ideas than I experienced 30 years ago when I began training. Uh, when I began training, there was only, they were only interested in fighting amongst themselves. Um, so when I began training, there was a split even within our organization, the Interregional Society of Analytical Psychology, between very classical Jungians, people who believed in the theories of James Hillman that's referred to as archetypal psychology, and the people that believed of the more the Lund, what was then called the London School or the developmental psychology. And there people were arguing and not talking to each other and having dinner on opposite sides of the room based on these kind of I don't see that kind of animosity at mm. all any longer uh, within our society and within many other societies. But there is going to be a, a segment of people within the Jungian world that would not like my book. And there are, there are institutes that would not invite me to speak at their institute because of the, the orientation that I have. Uh, mm. Well, I what I uh, what I had uh, thought about was this cultivating. You said in the book this cultivating a curiosity around, and so if we can't do, I mean, that's what what we do in the analytic diet is that we have to cultivate this curiosity. Mm. And and it, uh, you know, my feeling is is that it would be obvious to cultivate a curiosity that the analysts themselves and the orientations themselves would cure, you know, have a curiosity about and broadening the family. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's one more thing, and that is like the difference between having a toolbox and taking the analytic attitude. Mm -hmm. And so those to me have a little overlap, but there is some difference. Can you speak to the difference between an analyst saying I have a big toolbox of and, and I have an analytic attitude. Right, yeah, I th thank you. That's a great question. That one that I speak about more directly in the interpretation book, but try to include a little bit here. Um, so a lot of people, when they get into the Jungian world or just hear about the Jungian world, they think it's about, oh, if we work with dreams, we're Jungians. Uh, or, oh, if we do sand tray work or if we do this kind of work we're Jungians and these these are all the tools that I think of trans uh, analyzing transference and counter transference analyzing defenses uh, examining um, all of these things are the tools in the toolbox but if they don't have something to hold them together then they kind of fall apart and we're just doing mm. another set of techniques. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can do cognitive behavioral therapy 
which is my original training, without having a particular attitude towards it. You apply the techniques and you hope for an outcome or, and you already know what the outcome it is that you want, uh, <laughs> you know? Uh, so it's a very closed system in my mind. The analytic yeah. attitude is one that's that for tolerates not knowing, uh, but is gathering information and forming impressions of what is happening, and testing out those hypotheses, those impressions, in real time. And so, to me, the analytic attitude is this ability, as Bion puts it, to uh, tolerate ambiguity, uh, to tolerate not knowing, and to not apply these techniques in some rigid codified way, mm. but to really think about it more as like jazz improvisation, where we're trying out certain phrases with other musicians. Mm. Mm. And we're waiting to hear what the other musician says with their instrument in response. Mm. Or like an artist who wonders, uh, well, what if I didn't do it this way? What if I did it this way? What if I used a knife rather than a brush? Mm -hmm. What if I mixed these two colors rather than relying on this color? Those mm -hmm. sorts of things are the part of the analytic attitude and what makes any analytic process alive. Jung didn't actually refer to the analytic attitude in his writings. He didn't use that terminology the closest thing he comes to it is something he called the symbolic attitude. Mm. But that was really something he was looking for in his patients, what cultivating in his patients. And he didn't really speak about it directly as I think he assumed that any analyst would have a symbolic attitude. But actually, I think that's not always the case. I do encounter some analysts who don't have a symbolic attitude thankfully not that many but it is possible to get through training and meet the requirements without having integrated this this kind of nebulous idea of an analytic attitude well um i, I have a sense that this conversation could go on and on yeah. um and uh, i don't know whether we've managed to use up forty thousand words Anna. i don't know if you've um, but I think that we've we've certainly filled up an hour, and um, this has been a very stimulating conversation. Um, thank you, everyone, for participating. And please um, do have a look at the book. I'm going to put the the book link to the book back in the chat right now. And um, oh, let me see if I can get that there. Yes. And um, I don't know whether Mark, Anna, whether you have anything you'd like to say in closing. I would like to say thank you, Stephen, for hosting this event. For those who don't know, Stephen's the uh, editor of something called the Jungian Directory, and they publish a weekly newsletter that lists almost everything very exhaustively that's happening in the Jungian world during the course of the week, new books, new conferences, things like that. And then it's also a website where all of these things are also listed. So if you haven't signed up for to be on the Jungian directory mailing list, please do so. Thanks, Mark. And Anna, anything you'd like to say to us? Well, thank you for inviting me. And I think it was a very fruitful discussion. And I hope mm. to see you uh, in, in more discussions too. Yes. Mm. And if I'll close by uh, quoting from... Um, Anil, um, Damon Falah has just released Anila Jaffe's um, sort of re-edits of Memories, Dreams and Corrections. I don't think it's actually, uh, 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 I don't think it's actually is called a remix, but it's kind of a remix. And at the end of the book, she um, quotes a note that Jung wrote three days before his death. And I'm just going to read the last paragraph. Um, so this is written on May 16th, 1961. And he writes, many paths lead to the central experience. Those who have descended to their own depths also recognize the value and legitimacy of other paths leading to the center. Knowledge of the manifold paths gives life its fullness and meaning. Mm. Lovely. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. And um, no, good morning, good afternoon, and good night, wherever you are. Thank you.
Thank, thank you all for coming.